Hi, welcome to Cyphopod. My name is Corey Clark and I'm an assistant professor of social psychology at Durham University and this is my co-host. I am Bo Weingard, an assistant professor of psychology at Marietta University, broadcasting per usual from an undisclosed location in Marietta, Ohio. <laughs> um, I didn't run my potential title by you, but I thought we could call it your mom's a just so story. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that, but I'm glad that it's recorded so that it won't get deleted from history. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about evolutionary psychology. At the request of some of our Twitter followers, we posted a question about what people wanted to hear us talk about. And Randy McGregor, Zetetic Advocate, and Chris Reynolds all said evolutionary psychology, and Bo had been wanting to do that anyway, so um, that's what we're going to do. But we got a lot of good suggestions, so maybe we will do some of the others as well in future episodes. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Um, so do you want to get us started just describing what is evolutionary psychology sure so let's yeah let's start with what is evolutionary psychology and i think I, I have two answers to that so the first answer is evolutionary psychology is simply the attempt to apply the principles of evolution by natural selection to humans the second answer is that it's a more specific and circumscribed enterprise probably best known among the heads of it would be Tubi and Cosmetes. And this brand of evolutionary psychology was kind of a synthesis between sociobiology and cognitive psychology. And it has other posits that not everyone agrees to, such as the notion that the mind is massively modular, or that is to say, there are a lot of regions in the mind that are dedicated to specific cognitive tasks. And there's debate about what exactly a module is. Do modules communicate with other modules, et cetera? But that view is still, I think, popular among some people in evolutionary psychology. So first is much more broad. Second is more narrow and sort of associated with the Tubi Cosmetes style of evolutionary thinking. And we're basically just talking about the application of evolutionary principles to yes. the human brain and to social behavior. Or just yeah, human behavior generally. That's right. No, I would accept some. I, I almost think that the modular debate has been, for the most part, a distraction. I think everybody accepts some version of modularity. And then the question is just how much modularity. So, yeah, we'll just focus on the more the broader mission of applying the principles of natural selection to humans and human social behavior specifically. Yeah. Yeah, so evolutionary psychology has been criticized um, quite a bit by other branches of psychology. Um, and maybe the most popular criticism, would you say, is the just so story criticism? Um, yeah, I would say without doubt that is the most sort, sort of most popular standby criticism. Yeah. yeah, and I think even during my time when I was in grad school and before that, I would hear that type of criticism from my professors, people who are actually teaching me psychology. So I think it's still pretty common among um, professors, people who are actually practicing uh, empirical psychology. Um, so do you kind of want to explain what the argument is? Yeah, so the argument originally stems, as do so many bad arguments against evolutionary psychology, with Stephen Jay Gould, who took it for from a Rudyard Kipling book in which Kipling attempted to explain, you know, the, the, with, le, with great levity how animals got the traits that they have. So the elephant, I can't remember how these stories go, but the elephant got its trunk because something pulled on its nose, you know, these silly things. So I think Gould's I read something point... that like one of them actually ended up being correct. Oh, like maybe right? about like why zebras have their stripes or why leopards have spots or something. Wait, do leopards have spots? <laughs> I don't I know. I think that they do, but we, we can, I, I cannot confirm 
nor will I deny that. I, I don't know. But the, the point that Gould was attempting to make in his original article was that a lot, now he was criticizing sociobiology at the time, and he was arguing that many sociobiologists had substituted clever storytelling for actual science and that the best story was winning the day instead of, I guess, the best science. And so I think one problem with the just so story criticism is it's become so faddish that a lot of people use it without even thinking about what it probably means. But if we're let's try to be charitable to it. So if we're if we're trying to be charitable to it, it seems as though the criticism suggests that evolutionary psychologists are content forwarding speculations that they can't falsify and glomming on to those speculations and acting as though they're, you know, true, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think um, it's just the idea that a lot of evolutionary psychology forward sort of explanations for why we observe certain patterns that seem plausible in comparison to a bunch of other um, data that we have, but that we can't actually test as the real explanation for right. why something appears to be the case. Um, can't, can't, or that we're too lazy to, which... <laughs> I think in a lot we, of cases we can't. So this, I, I think this is an important distinction, because in cases in which we can't test competing hypotheses, inevitably we have to try to tell the best story that we can. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I mean, if you can't test it, I don't think that means you should just throw up your arms and say anything goes. What you should do is attempt to construct the best theory that is, of course, constrained by other evidence that we have and then use that theory. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but then is the criticism that it's doing something slightly different than what other branches of psychology and science are doing, where they're actually potentially forwarding more falsifiable hypotheses. I'm not sure that that's true, but is it possible? Well, we can, we, we can get to that in a moment. I, I guess I'm saying, or I'm asking, do you think that, I guess what I'm saying is I think it makes a difference what one contends a just so story is about so if a just so story is a problem because in principle you can't test it then i think that undercuts the force of the argument because if we have a problem that we can't test mm -hmm. we it seems to me perfectly legitimate to it, now, they would call this speculation, but speculation is good, especially if it's disciplined by other evidence. It seems to me that's what we should do. If it's because we're not bothering to test it, that's a different, that's another problem. So one could criticize, for example, an armchair evolutionary psychologist for just doing a bunch of speculation and then not mm -hmm. bothering to test it. That's a fair criticism because obviously we should test the theories or somebody should. I think the first one's not fair. And here's it. Here's what I see a lot. One clever argument people like to make is, well, you can't possibly know what the selective forces were, right? So we attempt to make an argument evolutionary psychology and we say ancestors who had this trait probably would have had higher fitness and therefore this trait would have passed on. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, that's a just so story because you can't travel back in time to figure out what the selective pressures were. So you can't actually falsify the theory, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a large part of the criticism comes from the overconfidence because you're right, a lot of it is speculation and so it should maybe be framed that way. Like this is plausible in relation to these other things that we think are true, but of course we can't know for sure that this is why this is happening. Well, yeah, so per force, it's speculation, obvious. I Maybe mean, we like, should give like an example. What's a good a good example from evolutionary psychology that people say is a just-so just -so story, but is very plausible? Well, I would say, for example, just sex differences in um, sexual strategies, what Buss and Schmidt would call mm -hmm. sexual strategies, stemming all the way back from Simons, because 
evolutionary psychologists have made significant pro pro uh, progress in understanding human mating behaviors, not surprisingly, because mating is so crucial to evolutionary success, it makes sense that evolutionary psychology would be good at this. And so one thing that evolutionary psychologists would contend is males gain more by pursuing a short-term mating strategy on average than do women. Mm -hmm. right or then do and females. by trying to have more sexual partners that's right because yeah. there's a relation between men's fitness well males fitness and sexual partners that holds that doesn't hold the same way for for females mm -hmm. now we can't travel back five million years ago or seven million years ago and look at the fitness success of Salanthropus chidensis ancestors and say, yep, the uh, more promiscuous men have more offspring. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, of course, we if that's what somebody means by test the theory, of course we can. Now, for that matter, we really can't test that a bone is from 7 million years ago. I mean, we can use carbon dating, but you could always come up with a, well, you weren't you didn't see the animal die, so so maybe Satan implanted it and then made it look old. I mean, I'm not sure no, that is a fair comparison. No, be, because but there are always I, I get that behavior doesn't fossilize, but there are always problems that you can raise with any of these disciplines, right? So paleontology has plenty of problems, paleoanthropology, <laughs> etc. We're all facing. <laughs> Uh, what? No, I just think it's funny to pick on paleontology, but yeah, all sciences <laughs> have plenty of problems. Yeah. I'm no, sure but I'm true. picking on that because it, it, it has to perforce speculate about the past and about processes in the past. That's why. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason we got here and we have the knowledge we do is because people such as Lyell and Darwin and other geologists we're speculating about the past and saying this is the most plausible story about mm -hmm. what happened, right? So this is this is why I I I don't want to say I abhor, but I I think I do abhor the just so story uh, criticism because it's a lazy. It there are good criticisms one could make. I think I think the just so story criticism is just lazy. But there um, have been cases where there were seemingly compelling explanations for things that turned up to be wrong because they were basically it, just so stories no but but newtonian physics is wrong it it was a compelling story it made in, in the case of New, newtonian physics of course it made predictions but it was also wrong right so i i yes of course I, some of these theories are going to be incorrect i mean that's just how so for example I think a good example of the incorrect, probably incorrect, let's say, is ovulatory shifts in female preferences. Mm -hmm. Right. So there was. Uh, Explain uh, there that all... because I don't think, I think a lot of people are familiar. I with mean, that. I'm going to make the simplest version of it because other people would argue otherwise. But I think the simplest version of the ovulation shifts hypothesis goes like this. So women can only get pregnant during a. a roughly a five-day window in their cycle. And in a lot of, in some primates, I don't want to say a lot, in some primates, women are really only sexually, females, excuse me, are really only sexually active during that window. And they have clear physical signs that they are ovulating. Yeah, um, so males can, can detect when yes. they should, yeah. Yeah, you can just look up a YouTube video. It's not pretty in chimpanzees, <laughs> for example, but it's there and it's pretty obvious. So and hu humans have long been considered to have, at, at the very least, cryptic ovulation. Some people would say it's concealed. That is to say, <laughs> men can't even ovulation. see it. Cryptic is the idea <laughs> men might be able slightly to pick it up via other cues. Like what? So, Well, some people have argued women women who are ovulating are more attractive to men, or maybe they smell yeah. better was one idea. There were some ideas. I don't buy really any of them, but the main idea was, okay, well, 
what if women, th this is like the bold idea. It's like, okay, you could imagine that women could gain genetically if they committed to like an average dude and got investment from him and then had sex on the side with somebody with quote unquote good genes and mm -hmm. got those genes. And when would you expect her to do that? Well, she should have sex when she's ovulating because that's when she can get pregnant, right? So it would be best to have the affair while she's ovulating. And that means she should most be attracted to males who are brawny and chiseled and show signs of like high testosterone because they have good genes. And mm -hmm. so their preference should shift maybe slightly from preferring, say, an average dude's face or a softer face to a more masculine good genes face when she's ovulating. Is this now, the smelling t-shirt study? There are things with that in there. There was it, there was a lot of stuff about this. And, okay. and to be, it, this is something I think is important though. I was always skeptical of this literature way you back. You knew it all along. No, I, <laughs> didn't, I didn't say that, although I was right. No. <laughs> For 15 years or however long I remember reading this literature, I was very skeptical of it. And I know other people who were as well, but it isn't an, it's not a completely preposterous hypothesis. And people thought that the, the story does make sense. And I think that's fine. And then mm -hmm. what happened is over time, people started noticing that a lot of these apparent effects didn't replicate or you find no effects, etc. Mm -hmm. The theory was criticized more. And I don't think a lot of people buy it anymore. So women so are the, not preferring more masculine yeah, it doesn't, looking men when they're fertile? Right. It doesn't seem as though that that's a consistent effect. It also, mm -hmm. I'm pretty skeptical that men, that women are more attractive to men when they're ovulating. Mm -hmm. Are there a few behavioral differences when women ovulate versus not ovulate? I don't know. I'm open to that. But anyway, the point is, yeah, you had this theory. It, it, it inspired a lot of research for 15 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. And pretty much most people have let it go. So in fact, in it's not falsified by one experiment, but that's not how science works. That's a misunderstanding of science, right? Science is more inference to the best explanation. We keep doing studies. Is this a fruitful paradigm? Wait a second, we're not getting any results time after time after time. Maybe this is a bad theory. Yeah, and it's a nice example of a just-so story where you could have collected more data and become more confident in the story or you could have become less confident in the story and so these things can often be tested in some ways uh if the story is true then x y and z should be true right. as well and if x y and z aren't true maybe we need to rethink the story yeah absolutely and for the i mean so first thing that's important is prior plausibility does the theory mm -hmm. make sense does it cohere with what we already know? And then let's look at the data. You know, let's collect new data. And then you move your priors to more confident or less confident. And that's that's how science works. I mean, uh, that's why the just so story, it, it's it's like tin rattling in my ear. It's just <laughs> it's an obnoxious it's an obnoxious criticism. And it should be replaced. But don't you think it's it is fair in some ways? No, I no, don't. it's not fair in any ways. I, no, I don't. I think it's a I think it's a complete misunderstanding of science, and it should be replaced with what would be fair, which is that specific theory is pretty thoughtless and doesn't make th sense. Okay, that's a criticism. It's almost a right? little bit more philosophical, though, isn't it? The just so story? No, coming up with with things that make sense, um, with stories that sort of make sense that you can't directly test. Uh, but I, I agree, it's slightly different in that a lot of these can be tested over time. With um, but but you can't you can't directly test any theory really, right? So that, <sighs> think of <sighs> Einstein's relativity. Stick. Let's focus on special relativity, right? So first of all, if you read how Einstein came to special relativity, yes, he thought about some experiments, the Michelson-Morley experiment, although he said he didn't take a lot from that. 
a lot of it was just from thinking through what must be the case, right? Mm -hmm. And then you forward a theory, and it did make certain predictions that were tested. But any one of those predictions, if you didn't find it, you probably wouldn't have said the theory's bunk. You would have said, okay, I'm a little less confident in the theory. Is there something else it predicts that we can look for, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's generally, you know, you can look at Dalton's atomic theory. Most science theories, that's how they work. Um, I'm not sure that that's true. A lot of theories can be tested. Okay. Directly, but. Well, no, no, no. Okay, okay. Give me an example of something that can be a theory that can be, I guess it depends on what we mean by tested directly, right? Yeah, I mean, just take one that we're familiar with is testing bias. Now, that's really hard, and there are really good alternate explanations for all bias findings that have been presented thus far, but the methods are pretty straightforward and seem to test it fairly directly. Do people treat right, but here, information differently? Right, but here's where I, I think this is important, though. What you're forwarding is not a theory. Bias isn't a theory. It's a cognitive. People are biased. That's a That's not a theory. No, it's not. That's a statement about people. That'd be like my saying people walk slowly. <laughs> people will be biased. When uh, no, <laughs> I think a theory would be why are people biased, right? So a theory would Does be the people are biased. Be well, to me, people are biased is not a theory. It, what is it's an observation about humans it'd be like saying people are tall okay that's not a theory that's an observation <laughs> well if saying people said, are biased predicts other things well okay i guess we could get into the weeds on what a theory is i don't consider people are biased a theory any more than i consider people speak a language to be a theory a theory would be People are biased because they're tribal animals and they evolved to be tribal animals and to value certain things more than the truth. That would be a theory. And you hmm, can't. Did someone test. write a paper on that recently? I don't know. <laughs> I, was the th I was the third author, so you what were. do I know? Um, but so, so I. Okay, so I guess we have to say this lurking in the background here, and I, I think we have to go over this. We don't want to devolve into a philosophy of science thing here, but lurking in the background is what I would call, and what other people such as Lakatos have called, naive Popperianism. So Karl Popper was a philosopher of science. He was a profound philosopher, and he had the idea of falsification. And that is because he thought there was an asymmetry between confirmation and falsification. That is to say, you can never definitively prove a scientific theory, mm -hmm. but you can definitively refute it. Hence, mm -hmm. you can falsify it. So what we should be doing is trying to falsify theories, right? Now, the naive Popperian thinks that falsification is how science works. And you just come up with a theory, you run an experiment, and then you're like, oops, falsified it. Let's move on. <laughs> Right, but that's not how science works. Science works like this. We have a really good theory. It's very plausible. It fits with everything we know about the world. So let's take Newtonian physics. Now, we have 87 observations, 50 of them match the predictions of the theory, and 30 deviate. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the 30 that deviate? Do we throw the theory overboard? Or... Is there something we're missing that would make would still be consistent with the theory or are our observational tools is there something wrong with them etc right so mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't work this this way it's it's much more complicated and i would say if we understand that about science then evolutionary psychology makes perfect sense and the just so story criticism becomes the sort of cheap rhetorical tool that it really is. Now, again, let me emphasize, there are perfectly legitimate criticisms of certain theories that come from evolutionary psychology. I don't have a problem with criticizing it. I have a problem with using a lazy criticism that should be replaced by a more specific and concrete, 
your proposal doesn't make sense because X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think most psychologists or perhaps any psychologist would reject evolutionary psychology in general. They reject certain things. And, and I think also right. most I, I, psychologists would say that if you're going to forward a theory, it should be consistent with evolution and it has to fit that framework in some ways. And if it's inconsistent, then possibly it's wrong or you need to rethink something. I agree with that, although I think this is the same thing with the blank slate, because you you make the point that the blank slate is a straw man argument. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think to, it is. To, to some degree, I agree with you. But I think what happens... I mean, you the, can look in, at the data uh, among correct. social psychologists. They are not blank slatists. Right, correct. Okay, so I, I agree with that. And I also agree that most social psychologists, in principle, would say, of course natural selection is the reason humans are here and so we have to consider that mm -hmm. but what i would say is in practice a lot of them are basically blank slatist on certain issues and they basically attempt to rid themselves of evolutionary psychology altogether so yes in principle accept in practice basically deny and if well, you they're forward... not ridding themselves of evolutionary psychology are they they're they're saying that for example so, which so... we'll maybe get to or maybe talk about uh, sex differences they would say mm -hmm. men and women evolved in similar environments and had similar problems for survival so why would we think their brains are going to be so drastically different so they're not denying I, evolutionary psychology or evolution. They're 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 using it to defend their position. I think. Oh, okay. So I think there are two categories. Uh, well, there are three. There are those who accept evolutionary psychology or some version of it. There are those who probably make the kinds of arguments you're contending they do. Right. So they just completely ignore sexual selection and make arguments that are pretty tendentious, but framed from an evolutionary framework. And then there are those who basically argue that evolutionary psychology is so unreliable and so full of just so stories that we don't even have to deal with it right now, right? I think there are people in all three camps. I've had many debates with people, sophisticated people in psychology who thought that evolutionary psychology was just a charade, right? It was it was a complete and ridiculous waste of time, a justification of the status quo and something that they didn't need to pay attention to. I don't think I've met many people like that, but you could be right. Okay, well, let me let me give a concrete example and, and uh, listeners can look this up. Uh, I, my brother, Robert Diener and I, Diener is a professor at Grand Valley State University. And your brother is Ben Weingard. Ben Weingard. We coded, we looked at the presentation of evolutionary psychology in sex and gender textbooks. I think we did 17. And they were, we couldn't confirm that they were the most popular, but they were popular. These are popular textbooks. And the presentation of evolutionary psychology is just reprehensibly bad in there. And then the theories that they forward make no sense, right? They just, they don't even make evolutionary sense. And I'll, I'll give it a to, and you can go in the appendix on the paper that we wrote and we, we literally what is the coded. Paper called? I guess we can post it in the stuff. Uh, yeah. Mi misrepresent. I, I mean, it's a very descriptive title. It's just like misrepresentations of evolutionary psychology or something. Mm -hmm. In the appendix, we literally have a quote from every mistake we coded. And what you will see is that these people have no clue how what natural selection even is. A lot of them were making the most rudimentary mistakes about uh, natural selection, including thinking that natural selection worked for the good of the species. And these these were psychologists. I mean, they were psychologists and sociologists, but the psychology books weren't that much better than the sociology books. Yeah, Von, Von Hippel and Buss have, I think, maybe both an article and a chapter yeah. where they go over some of these things like um, that if you basically believe that 
evolution shaped the human brain, then that means that situations or uh, social features of the environment don't influence behavior whatsoever, um, and some other common misconceptions um, about evolutionary psychology that are not true. Um, right, so I guess what I'm saying is that there are a lot of people who are practicing research psychologists who know so little about evolution by natural selection that they can't possibly be using it as a guide for their theories because they actually don't understand the theory. Yeah, I'm not saying they're using it as a guide, but I do think that most or, or psychologists even... would say that at least has to be consist. It can't be... It can't be obviously inconsistent with evolutionary sure. principles. I, I agree. If if I said, here's my theory. Three million years ago, a soul got implanted into the human brain, and that's why we're different from our ancestors. They would say that that's ridiculous. <laughs> I agree with that. Well, so even they, like something like people prefer unattractive partners or something like that. Well, no, I, I think there are actually more psychologists than we might imagine who would argue that beauty is basically a social construct. They did they did cover that in, I forget, one of the Von Hippel and Bus papers where people, I think most people agreed to some extent that there were semi-universal standards of attractiveness. But yes, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't like that conclusion and they don't want to think well, that some people right. can be most people would agree that some people are better looking than other people. Yeah. And so, okay. So I, I guess there are a lot of these criticisms aren't just the just so criticism. So let's get rid of the just so story criticism and point out that in my opinion, you can speak for yourself. I will say, I think it's a, it's a lazy, completely unedifying criticism that is used pretty much solely to score rhetorical points or just to dismiss something that one dislikes. There are good criticisms one can make of many theories, and one should make those criticisms. The just so story criticism is not one, and it relies upon a misunderstanding of how science works. Okay, so <laughs> you can conclude with just so story. No, I don't really have uh, strong feelings about it. I do think that evolutionary psychology has done a lot for our understanding of human behavior. And so I'm a fan in general, and I would agree that most theories would have to be coherent with that framework. But I kind of understand the criticism in some cases. And um, Wait, but understand. So, so there's an important point, though. Understanding it in some cases, then just make the criticism that the story that's being told in a specific case is wrong. Right? I don't understand the more general criticism, which is, it's the, the general criticism's wrong. I agree with you that there are, I have read theories from an evolutionary perspective believe me, where I just thought, wow, that is outrageous. Like, there's just no way that doesn't even make sense. And what I would do is criticize that theory. I wouldn't say, well, just so story. Here we go again. <laughs> right. I would say I don't this think is a people bad tend story. to just say just so story. And that's the end of it. That's usually one of multiple arguments. I think. Sure, OK, Sure, that's fair. But I, I, I guess my point is what we should do is focus on why the particular hypothesis is bad rather than using this rhetorical tool that doesn't enlighten, right? So, yeah. so I, for example, once read a paper that suggested that males fall asleep after having sex to avoid commitment discussions. That was the evolved <laughs> function of falling asleep <laughs> after sex. Now... I thought that's a creative hypothesis that has virtually zero percent chance of being correct, <laughs> and it was framed as an evolutionary hypothesis, right? Now, why can't that be correct? I, I mean, it's I like mean, a very specific. It uh, just it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and I thought I I remember in my review I wrote a bunch of reasons that I thought like there it just doesn't make fitness sense, but. 
okay, I mean, it's a hypothesis, Doesn't it make right? any sense to want to avoid conversations about commitment? Well, that sleeping would be the way to do it. Couldn't the woman just talk to you in the morning about it? I mean, it just yeah, doesn't Yeah, I guess it'd be better to leave than to fall asleep right. and be I in the mean, same place. It seems as being hyper alert and getting out of there would be the best way to avoid it. But, <laughs> but maybe people, maybe women are more forgiving of a sleeping partner than yeah, a man who just books or, it. Or they're like, well, he fell asleep. I can't have the conversation now that I was going to have. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> what I would say is let's criticize the logic there instead of using a the, that's a just so story. Criticize I the specific logic. Theory. OK, and you like the theory, maybe. <laughs> so I, it's all right. I mean, I, I we test theories. That's what we do. I mean, I don't have a big problem with that. I just thought it was a kind of creative and implausible theory. Um, so anyway, my point would be. Focus on the specifics of the theory that you're trying to criticize rather than making this broader. And I've been in debates with intelligent people who say this too. And it. it who say what? They, they just use this just oh, so yeah. story reflex to dismiss an entire field. And it is truly frustrating, I think. Well, we'll get into this. So I'll just. But stop again, there is that is so that thing. really about the confidence, though? Like, is it about. Yeah, your story is plausible, but okay. it's one plausible story among many plausible stories. So I'm not going to just agree with you. I'm going to be skeptical no, no, until I'm, you I'm forward talking, better data. I'm saying a, a more of a meta argument about evolutionary psychology in general, right? So I, I'm it's like, I remember. Yeah, I guess well, I'm talking about application of it to specific theories. Sure. But then what I'm saying again is if, if, if we're talking about specific theories, mm -hmm. let's focus on, instead of calling it a just so story, criticize the hypothesis, right? C say, what is wrong with the hypothesis? Why, why does it seem implausible well, it might be to hard you? To, like, it's hard to say, why is it a bad theory that men fall asleep after no, sex? It's, because... it's real. No, it's really not. It's not hard at all. I made a list. I mean, we could come up with a lot of reasons that that's probably not. I don't know what's on your not... list, but. It, well, you some... and I, we could come up with 10 reasons right now. You could have the conversation in the morning. Leaving would be a better way to avoid it, et cetera, et cetera. Sleeping is dangerous for other reasons. I could, just... I could refute a lot of those probably, but we won't, we won't get into that right now. I don't, I don't disagree with you, but this is what we do in science. I mean, okay. So again, I, I'm ending my point just by saying, okay. focus on the specific hypothesis and argue against it instead okay. of using this broad term. All right. So okay. I think where we wanted to go from here, so we kind of already discussed the just so story criticism of evolutionary psychology. Um, did we want to talk about why people seem to be particularly well? well, well is it okay, true? So let, let me let, let's let's go over the. I, I, I'm interrupting, but I do want to go over the fitness question because this is an argument people forward a lot that. How can you possibly know the fitness consequences in our ancestral past of some behavior or another, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is important because it's true. You can't obviously travel back in time, as I pointed out, and test this Yet. directly. So what you have to do is what we do in other things. We think carefully about it. We have a reconstructed past environment because of the great work of lots of scientists. And we think carefully, would this have increased the fitness? Probably. Of course, you can't know. You have to say probably would it have. So for example, w I, w start with the easy and go to the harder is usually a good way of doing this. So would blinding oneself at age 12 with your fingers be, would that increase your fitness or decrease it, right? Okay, well, we can say, yeah, obviously that would decrease it. What about banging your face against the tree until you become hideous? Would that increase or decrease? Of course, that would decrease. And then we go, okay, so those are obvious and easy ones, but they're pointing out it's not as if we're just like whistling in the wind here, 
you know, we can actually think about this pretty carefully and come to a reasonable conclusion about what would or would not have increased fitness. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? Because that is a debate I've been in many times and it frustrates me. We can tell. <laughs> um, no, I think that is fine for you to have the final word on that bit. Okay. Um, so, uh, I forget what you wanted to talk about, but, um, go ahead. I thought, I thought you had a, I thought you were making a transition. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about our, so we talked about the just so criticism, just so mm -hmm. story criticism, evolutionary psychology are certain branches of psychology unfair to evolutionary psychology and why would that be the case yeah so our, our i mean like why would if people are somehow yes. biased against evolutionary psychology which you would probably say that they are then why would they yeah. be right so this is a good question um so maybe we should talk really quickly about the von hippel and bus results. This is in social psychology only. Um, and they just polled a bunch of social psychology professors. And right. virtually all of them agreed that evolution happened is happening. Um, and that what was the second thing that everyone sort of basically agreed with that humans that that evolution has shaped humans. But yeah. there was not disagreement, but a wide range of opinions regarding how much evolution applies to human social behavior. So is human yes. social behavior shaped by evolutionary pressures in the same way other animals' behavior and other aspects of humans, like our bodies, let's say, for example, right. were shaped right. by evolution? And that, and, and that, I think, is, again, is what I'm saying about this kind of selective dualism, This this sort of yeah, of course, evolution happened. But then if you say anything concrete about what that means, no, that that that's not right. Right. <laughs> so there's this sort of evolution stopped at the neck. And for some reason, the human brain miraculously avoided the selection pressures. So they didn't they didn't have a question about the human brain. And I would have to assume if they did, oh, no. most social psychologists would say, yes, the brain was shaped by evolution. I, I think it's tricky because the question is how much of our social behavior is shaped by evolution. And then sure. that question sort of hard to understand because does it, it's possible some people were interpreting that question as asking, do social features cause human behavior? And social psychologists being social psychologists, of course, think social features are very important. Right. But I think that, that both can be true. And that's what that's what like. OK, so first of all, I would agree. But th the question might have produced misleading but, results. But let's take a, let's take a concrete example, though. So let's take sex differences, because that's a concrete example about mm -hmm. which there is controversy. And a lot of social psychologists would sort of dispute the standard evolutionary psychology uh, story about sex differences. So you just want to briefly it's, tell people what? that would mean i assume most of our listeners would know but well sex okay so basically you would have a whole suite of sex differences predicted from sexual selection theory mm -hmm. men would be more prone to taking risks they would be more hierarchical they'd have desire more for status they would uh, be more attracted to short-term sexual affairs they probably have some cognitive differences. Maybe they're better at visio-spatial rotation. Uh, they're more but, into rough and tumble play. All of these But the things, basic idea is just that men and women would have slightly different brains because correct. they they had they faced slightly different selective pressures. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the, the first difference, the most obvious difference that they have and the obvious sele different selection pressure they faced is... Women can only get pregnant from men and men can only get pregnant from women. <laughs> so like I, I find it it's people don't even think about that one when they talk about sex differences. Well, primary sex difference is men are attracted to women and women are attracted to men. But That's that refers pretty... to our junk, not our brains. 
well, our brains are what making or what what is making us attracted to different junk. You would agree, right? <laughs> yeah, but you're talking about attraction versus ability to become impregnated by or impregnating. Well, right, but the two are related, obviously, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. So but anyway, so yeah, there's a suite, there's a, a suite of sexual, uh, of sex differences predicted by natural selection, the broad theory, but then also parental investment theory, mm -hmm. sexual selection theory, which is based on that, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, what I find bizarre about the, the view of a lot of social psychologists who tend to be pretty skeptical of some of these claims is that you have to somehow believe that we went from a chimpanzee type ancestor. I mean, because chimpanzees have clear sex differences, right? Sex differences in behavior, etc. We went from that. Somehow we lost that. So then we didn't have, you know, very many sex differences. But then patriarchs got together and somehow made those again via we socialization. We don't know if chimpanzees <laughs> were exposed to m media like... Girls should play with dolls. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, sure, but yeah, actually, there are studies though that show that even um, they're socialized. Like socialized e slightly. No, no, even monkeys prefer they have sex differences in toy preference. Really? But yeah, but That's my cute. my my point is, it's. On the face of it, it's absurd. And what it seems to me to illustrate is, one, a misunderstanding of natural selection, but two, what I've been saying, which is this kind of selective application of evolution that is frustrating. Because these people mock evangelical Christians for denying evolution, but they deny it just as much, just in a more sophisticated way. I wouldn't way. say they deny, deny it just as much. They deny certain components of it. Yeah, in they deny it in areas. A, yeah, I agree. But and they deny it. It is possible that it's possible that you could that men and women might their brains might not be that different, right? Well, I think we're talking about two different things. Are there? How different are their brains versus how different is their are their natural propensities? Because it could be that sure. sm small differences in the brain might cause large differences in behavioral tendencies, right? So sure. I think the the brain thing sort of like a, a I mean I think there are sex differences in the brain, of course, but in some sense it's a red herring because we know there are sex differences in behavior, and unless behavior is coming from a soul then it's coming from small differences in the brain somewhere. Well, but we don't know that we aren't exposing men and women to different environments. So it's a very plausible argument that a lot of male-female sex differences are driven by the different environments that we put them in. And we tell women that they should be this way and men should be that way. It's a plausible you do have to hypothesis wonder why that those has exist, absolutely... but, but nonetheless... Okay, so... But it's a see. So it's one of those. It's a plausible hypothesis that has virtually no support, right? It's, it's one of those things that people just say it and they think it makes sense, but it doesn't. There's no evidence that you can socialize a sex to behave like in some completely different way. If socialization worked so well, we'd be very peaceful creatures, and there'd be no crime. The problem is it's the violent video games. That's true. That is, that is true. And iPhones and oh, violent no, you're video frozen. games. Okay, you came back. Yeah. Oh, um, I froze. Uh -oh. Yeah, you're fine. So well, anyway. let's talk about one from the Von Hippel and Bus one because we have the data okay. on it. So they have, um, um, is it harder for men? I think it's like, is it harder for men to not cheat on their romantic partners or something like that? And social psychologists are kind of all over the board on it. Um, they had an interesting question, which is, would it be good or bad if someone said that men have a harder time not cheating on their partners? Um, and most people, to their credit, said it wouldn't be good or bad, which I think is a good position to have if you're a scientist to say, well, we should care about the truth first and then yeah, so, deal with the consequences? Are you looking it up right now? 
Yeah, I wanted to see specifically. Um, this one was in, I, I believe this one was in the article, not the chapter. Yeah, this is the article. Um, but okay, so for few example, people said where, it would be you... good and a lot of people said it would be bad. This is what I'm saying is like what you see here is a pattern that, yes, they accept in the abstract of sort of like evolution. Mm -hmm. But then when you ask them concrete things, then they change. Right. So you get if you ask people. Uh, how likely is the finding true? Imagine that science found the same evolutionary principles that guide animal behavior also guide human behavior. And you find mostly people very likely to say that that that's plausible and true. Mm -hmm. But then when you ask, for example, humans have a genetic tendency to be aggressive and violent under circum certain circumstances when not restrained by the laws and norms of modern society, you get a much more mixed answer. Right. Or there are universal standards of attractiveness held by people across the world for men and women such that there's an ideal appearance for whatever, whatever. Again, you get a much more mixed answer. So it seems I, like... Well, I, I honestly take issue with some of these questions and I wish... Uh, they they ask better ones because I do think that their results are meaningful and they, they do show something that's real about social psychologists and perhaps psychologists in general. Um, but saying that there's an ideal uh, attractive person or something implies that like yeah, people would generally really like agree on what like the most attractive person no, I, would look I, I like agree. and they wouldn't. I mean, there would be strong correlations between sure. ratings, but that's it. I, I agree. I, I don't think that that's a particularly good way of framing it. I think the uh, some of the questions are, uh, yes, I mean, it's hard to ask these questions. And sometimes, you know, obviously you, and you ask a poor question. But what it does illustrate, I think, and I, re I remember I read the, the, the I don't know if I've read that one, but I read the one in the, the um, book edited by Jocelyn Crawford. Mm. And in that one, you know, these results and again it seems as though the pattern's pretty clear which is in the abstract they accept all these principles but then when you ask them concrete questions that follow from them then they're not as they're not likely to accept that or they're at least more skeptical right when you ask a concrete well i mean because i guess the thing is like one of the questions or one of the things you said before was that, well, somebody might argue that men and women evolve, you know, they evolved in similar selective regimes and therefore they're similar. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's preposterous. Right. It, it doesn't make any How sense. How is that preposterous? Because women have to internally gestate for nine months. Men don't. Men the, the, the female sex egg is enormous compared to the male sex egg. This is anisogamy. I think it's, I don't know how many times bigger it is. It's a lot bigger. These differences alone would lead to mammoth differences. I would say it's preposterous to say that there should be no differences at all. It is not right. preposterous that they should be very similar. Well, okay, but then I guess depending we have to on define, how you define similar, exactly, or we have to define very similar. But what I'm saying, but is that, that I don't know how much of these conversations are. Are they just they? I'm on team. There are sex differences versus I'm on team. These sex differences are probably kind of small, and now we probably actually sort of agree. We're just using. We're not agreeing on what's big and what's small and what's similar and what's different. I mean, I think there's some of that, but I don't think that that I, I don't think that that explains it. And I, I think what happens is a lot of Mott Bailey fallacy. You know, somebody makes a, a bold claim and then they kind of back up and say, well, of course, they're different. But right. Yes. And I, uh, I suspect most social psychologists would agree with that. Um, would agree with what? what they would agree that there probably are differences between men and women. They would just say we should focus yes. on the similarities because focusing on the differences can be harmful. And it's not obvious to me that that's not true. Like it, it could be harmful. And I think a good example is this one with the, is it harder for men not to cheat on their partners? Mm -hmm. it, it actually could be harmful. Even if you said that's true. Yeah. We don't have to make policies based off of, whatever biological realities but 
it could be hard to stop a sort of more lenient attitude toward men's infidelity then. Oh, okay. So you you just threw a lot out there. So now we're getting into like the 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 apparent. <laughs> like I don't want to political... talk about why why do um, people seem to resist certain types of evolutionary explanations for social behavior. I I honestly think, and it. I know you laugh about this and you think I like to do this. I really don't. It pains me to think this, but I can't help but think that virtually all of it is ideologically motivated. And one thing that persuades me that that's correct is I don't know a single person who's in fervid, who is a fervid critic of evolutionary psychology and especially of the evolutionary psychology of sex differences who's not also liberal to progressive on the political scale. I'm, I might be missing somebody, but generally what you get is what you're saying. People who, people who make political arguments, this is potentially pernicious because it, it, it might promote the, the notion that men should be allowed to cheat more or something, right? Yeah, but I'm saying potentially the reason it appears to be ideologically motivated is because the concern is sort of part of the ideology, but it's not the cause of it. The real okay, issue so, could just be the concern about the consequences. And I don't think well, we should just ideal. dismiss that because it's true. No, no. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just ahead. going to say like certain scientific claims can have, even if scientists want to try to stop certain realities from having negative consequences that that's not always possible and sometimes you can't stop consequences from flowing from particular okay agreed realities. so let's talk about that in a minute so let's first know that one thing that the people who are critics of evolutionary psychology would say and i want to be fair to them because this is what they would say to me well i'm not ideological it's the evolutionary psychologists who are ideological they're supporting a, you know, sort of quasi neoliberal patriarchal status quo. And that's why I'm a critic of it. So this is what Gould or Luantin would have said or would say is that it's an ideological enterprise. Now, I think that that we, we can show that that's wrong because actually evolutionary psychologists are just as liberal as other psychologists. They're, they're in fact, on average, very liberal people. Mm -hmm. Are there some people who promote evolutionary psychology for ideological purposes? Absolutely, <laughs> right? Is the enterprise itself ideologically motivated? I don't think so. In fact, what I tend to see is that a lot of the people I respect in evolutionary psychology are better at separating facts from values and they understand that they can analyze this and it doesn't have to have ideological consequences. So that's my argument about that. Now, your, your statement is, well, is it true that some of these theories might have pernicious consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an empirical question and I'm not sure I, I I mean, I guess we'd have to take it on a case by case issue. I think they could. And I don't. And I think they probably I think the folk belief that men have a harder time, let's take not cheating on their partner. Right. I would suspect that everyday people would say that's, yeah, probably true if you look at the world. So there is a folk belief in that. And I suspect people actually do judge men less harshly when they cheat than women. And that's probably possibly true, because but I don't they've th noticed that men appear to have a harder time. See, I don't think it's driven by that. I think they judge women slightly more harshly because of the disparity and consequences for the relationship. But so a, we're not a, a woman always concerned about the relationship, right? And I've made this point to you before. It's not obvious to me that women having multiple partners is worse for society than men having multiple. I think it's, it's probably worse if men do. So why don't we judge men as harshly as we judge women? Right. I agree with that. But 
if you're a male in a relationship, it's worse for you probably because you could potentially get cuckolded. And that's gen genetically speaking, that's a disaster. Whereas a woman cannot get cuckolded. So I think that that's the disparity that's important well, in the context. in some ways she can, because if the guy starts to care about the other partner more. Sure, I'm not, right. Or even I, cares I'm not, enough about her that he allocates resources. That he d diverts her. resources. Yeah, sure. I'm not, I'm not saying women don't face real consequences. Obviously, women aren't thrilled about getting cheated on. And I don't think anybody, uh, well... Most people don't think that, that it's acceptable to cheat on one's wife, right? However, I do think there are, you know, there are disparate costs or potential costs, and that probably explains the different reactions. I don't know. I'm speculating. It could be, as you said, that people just think men have a harder time refraining from it, and therefore it's more understandable, although... Notice one could make one could accept that principle. Men have a harder time and then say, well, because of that, we need to be even harsher on them. So it's not mm. clear that lenience is the natural sort of corollary. I suspect it is, though, because that I, I think that must be the reason why people are so terrified. It has to be that the natural intuition that follows from that is, well, then we shouldn't judge men as harshly. And people are wanting... people are terrified by what? It, it, it seems people don't want to accept that that could be true because they are. Afraid. No, no, no. Let's be clear about who's not accepting this. This is point one percent of a super hyper educated portion of the population. Right. Yeah, yeah, I don't know okay. what it would look like among regular people. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. So regular what would you say? <laughs> uh, Non-social you... psychology professors. Right. But when you say this, you, don't, you say terrified. I don't think that any of my non-academic friends would give a who. They would just be like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. We're talking about this very small hyper-educated, progressive segment of the population. Sure. Okay. Um, but I think the reason you get some of this resistance for some of these claims, same thing applies mm -hmm. for sex differences, I think probably a big reason some people wish to downplay the extent to which men and women are different is because they fear that that would justify unequal treatment. Oh, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is... And, and I'm saying that that fear might be valid. Okay, so w let's consider that point in a moment. What's interesting to me about these things, and you find it with human group differences too, is that my non-academic friends don't give a who. And I was talking to my brother... You have non-academic friends? I have a few. My brother and I were <laughs> I talking about this, how if you talk to non-academics... They don't care about these things. They're just like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Most of them, <laughs> at least. It's only when you get to this elite subset of the population who are hyper-educated that all of a sudden these wor worries become, uh, you know, they're, that they're rampant. Now, maybe the worries are right, but I think we need to be clear that you're, you're talking about the intuitions of a very small group of people, mm -hmm. not of the broader population. Mm -hmm. Now, is it the case, and it's not the next period, but, well, okay, there are two questions. One is, let's suppose that it, it, it's slightly dangerous. Let's imagine a world in which it's slightly dangerous to promulgate these theories. Should we care? That's one question. Yeah. Right? Should we, should we attempt to censor the truth? And, the, and I guess the other one is, is it? Is it potentially dangerous? And I don't see the, especially with sex differences, I, I frankly don't see any, I'm not concerned in the slightest that it would cause anything bad in the world. I don't, I don't even understand that argument it, very much. It could, it could lead people to accept certain inequalities that some people Such as? might. Well, 
um, let's say men, uh, men are better, slightly better than women at math. Okay. Then when you look at the top levels of achievement in math, uh, Ivy League professors, um, field medalists, you're not going okay. to find many women. And okay. if people accept that men might be slightly better than women at math, then we might be totally cool with there being few, if any, Ivy League math professors that are women. So what? I'm saying I guess I just some don't people, see that as a disaster. Some people would see that as a disaster. Okay, but then they, okay, that's fair. But if you're, okay, so let's take a different example. Just take one that's more extreme. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so we pro promulgate the notion that there are intrinsic sex differences in throwing ability. Mm -hmm. And man, if you look at Major League Baseball, there's not one woman in the in the sport. So are we just justifying this patriarchal sport? Or, yes. <laughs> or is it just that men are better at it and women are better at certain things? And I don't think that should be a problem. And we should be perfectly accepting of those disparities. Yeah, I mean, it is weird that we're more okay with it in certain domains. But I suspect in sports, I think it's, it's because, because they're undeniable. They're very undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, so. and also, I, I to be clear with the mathematics example, it, the literature is really complicated on quote unquote math advantage for one sex or the other. I think what's less yeah, complicated. Like a, if you look on the SAT math portion, men yeah, have men always score done higher. slightly better. Yeah. Right. So they generally, on, on like, formal tests like that they seem to score better although they get worse grades and there yeah. seems to be no difference in like sort of the the rudimentary math skills or the the, the sort of scaffolding skills i did look up Here, um field medalists there's only been one female ever i don't know how many times it's been given out but right so i think there are a couple of things that might explain that one the greater variant hypothesis mm -hmm. and two and I think this which is, is just the idea boring. that there's more variance among males, which means that they're going to be more right. males at extremes. And anyone at, who gets a fields medalist is an extreme. Right. Yeah. You're talking about 0.001%, you know. The other one, which I think is probably more important, is the desire for status and the, the um, willingness to work that mm -hmm. hard at a sort of non-human abstract activity. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate... So you're saying, I do think, I agree with you that people are worried about this. I think it's a misguided worry is what I'm saying. I also wonder, I think probably most social psychology professors or psychologists in general would say that fear of consequences has little to no influence on their work or the way they evaluate other work. So even yes. though that's a an explanation that I might forward for why you see these results. And I think Von Hippel and Buss say the same thing. They say that they're afraid of these consequences, but we don't need to have these consequences. I don't think anyone actually thinks that's why they resist. I think I, I posted like a Twitter poll a mm, few months ago or something. And I asked, how much are you like driven to um, improve the world versus understand the world if you're a social scientist? Mm -hmm. Virtually everyone said understand. Nobody said improve. Um, but it does seem to be such a large part of what social scientists do trying to improve the world. So I don't really know. I, I guess nobody thinks that they're biased. So you're not going to get. Right. I mean, very few. It's, but I it's mean, hard to are... know why people would resist certain well, there are some people who would explicitly say, especially you get this on like ethnic group differences, who would explicitly say, we ha we should have more stringent standards here. Like if we're going to mm -hmm. talk about population differences, you have to be more careful and you need more rigorous evidence than if you're talking about something else. I would say maybe that's else. fair. Right. That's a separate discussion. I, I think that that's a, it's a reasonable argument, I would mm -hmm. say, but. I guess what I'm saying is there are some kind people of like if you're going to say that liberals or conservatives are more right about human nature, you should have really good evidence. <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the problem is with the double standards game is 
you can always apply it when you don't like what your opponents, sure. quote unquote, are doing. So I can say, well, Stalin was basically an environmentalist and that was really bad. So you need better evidence if you forward an environmental hypothesis, right? And it's <laughs> okay. Why don't we all just have stringent standards? And I, I mean, yeah. me, you know, okay, that's a complicated debate. But I guess what I'm saying is some people do make their concern, they're candid about their concern, right? They would say, and the number of books, by the way, and the the number of philosophers and intellectuals who contend that people who write about sex differences are just apologizing for the status quo makes me suspicious and again, supports the ideological argument, right? So look at what people said about James Damore when he was mm -hmm. fired. They basically said, tech, tech bro is just using evolutionary psychology to justify his invidious stereotypes mm -hmm. and it, it, we're using it to hold down women, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that they're so quick to make that argument suggests that that's what they're worried about and that they believe evolutionary psychology is this kind of, you know, per pernicious potpourri of theories designed by patriarchal men to hold women down. Yeah, and I don't think we really know if that could be true, if these theories would for the average person justify certain types of inequalities. Um, well, sure, I agree with, I, yes, we don't, we we're, don't know I, that. We're running out of time, so just, we're, we're out. What are we at? We're at an hour and 11 minutes. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> let's end, let's end with four minutes on something, so, okay, so. Four minutes on something? Well, I want to end with pan-human nature, and I want to say here's where I think we could criticize evolutionary psychology. So I want to uh, let's know evolutionary psychology. I, I, we're you like it? I consider it one of the greatest achievements of psychology in the twenty twenty first century. I think that it there are legitimate things we can criticize about it, and one of the legitimate things we can criticize, which is just clearly falling apart now, is the notion that there's a pan-human nature. Now, pan-human nature means humans everywhere are basically the same because, uh, I think Tubi and Cosmides' quote is, the human skull houses a Stone Age brain. So the idea was pretty much every cognitive tendency we have, we evolved, you know, between 50 and 10,000, well, even farther, 200 and 10,000 years ago, and therefore we're all the same. A lot of people have pointed out that this probably doesn't hold up and that there are human population differences and that the positive of a pan-human nature is, you know, sort of half correct. I, I like to use the example of a pan-canine nature. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, there there's a pan-dog nature, right? It's um. like if you Bill Chopik and his colleague published like the first ever paper on dog personality and there are like dog differences in personality. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so we, we all kind of we'll know We'll post this. that one in the, the, whatever, in the description. But don't study differences in dog intelligence because that will get you in trouble, right? <laughs> Stay away, that's like the third rail of canine studies. Specifically, but, uh, if you say someone's own dog breed is the least intelligent, that's people right. don't like that. Papillons, yeah. I'm sorry, papillons. <laughs> Pit bulls are the most intelligent, Obviously. we know that. Yeah, uh, sure. But anyways, yeah, so the point is, that's probably the future, I think, of, I, I, I will conclude by saying this. The future of evolutionary psychology is integrating two things totally integrating behavior genetics, which is the study of human variation, which is weird because it doesn't quite work with the study of consistent pan human nature. And then also integrating group differences will be the next uh, step for evolutionary psychology. So that would be my conclusion. And of course, that will create even more controversy than the sex differences. So we'll be doing this for a long time. <laughs> All right. You don't have a concluding statement? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll end it there then. All right. See ya.